I think one of the most amazing stories of history is how the ancient Hebrews, a small, relatively powerless people in the ancient world, came to be, I think, probably the most influential people group ever to live. The historian Marvin Perry writes that the fact that the Hebrews survived as a people, the fact that they even survived, that alone is a marvel to history. Let alone that this people would, I think in terms of influence, probably end up being the most influential people group ever. What's interesting is, is the only clear depiction of ancient Jews that I'm aware of comes to us from the Romans. And this image here depicts the Jews being carried off into captivity after a great uh, Jewish revolt against the Roman Empire in the year 70. So that's interesting that the one image we have of, of the ancient Jews uh, is an image of conquest, of them being taken into slavery. So we look at the map here, um, which shows us the part of the world that is roughly associated with ancient Israel, with the ancient Jews, uh, and that is present-day Israel. We look at this map and you see in the eastern Mediterranean there uh, that ancient Israel, you see Jericho is, is, um, is marked there on the map. Ancient Israel is within the sphere of influence of Mesopotamia and Egypt. Here we see the map of Egypt and you see Egypt's influence going right up through present-day Israel along the eastern Mediterranean. We have Greek empires that spread into the Middle East, Egypt, and then you see there once again the eastern Mediterranean, present-day Israel, uh, part of a Greek empire. Here we have the Roman Empire at its greatest extent, and if you look at that same region of the world, now uh, present-day Israel is under Roman control. Now in Hebrew literature, in the Old Testament, we do read about the, the, the ancient Israelites um, conquering other peoples. These are peoples who are even weaker than the ancient Israelites were. But relative to these great powers, when we think of the, the Greek empires, Alexander the Great, for example, when we think of the Egyptian empires, when we think of the Roman empires, um, then, you know, Israel is not in any way a formidable power. And the Jews are, uh, e even their own literature tells us about how the ancient Hebrews are slaves in uh, Egypt. They're slaves in Babylon. The, uh, the Apocrypha, uh, these uh, Hebrew writings that come between the Old Testament and the New Testament tells us about um, difficulties the ancient uh, Hebrews, the ancient Jews have face-to-face uh, -face with the Greeks. We come to early Christian writing and we're reading about Jewish communities and the Roman Empire is in control. So ancient Israel is by no means a powerful country, to use that phrase. The ancient Jews are by no means a powerful people, often enslaved, often beat down. And yet it's remarkable that they've had such influence. And I think one of the things that's interesting is when we think about the ancient Israelites, um, we don't have anything like the art that we have from ancient Mesopotamia, that we have from ancient Greece, that we have from ancient Rome, that we have from uh, ancient Egypt. And I've said this before in different videos, that remember that the ancient Hebrews in the, in, the, in the Ten Commandments, one of the commandments says, don't make images of anything. Often we emphasize what that passage says, don't make any images of God. But the passage actually says, don't make any images of anything. And I think that's the fundamental explanation why we don't have statues from ancient Israel, right? Why we don't have figurines from ancient Israel as we do from other ancient cultures. We do have some ancient things. Interesting, these two images here both give us script, ancient script associated with the, the ancient Hebrews. And that, I think, is relevant because although the Hebrews left us no great monuments in terms of statues or something like that, they did leave us the great monument of their writing. Not only what is often called the Old Testament, but I'm thinking primarily of the Old Testament. And the Old Testament is a 
uh, it's a very diverse collection of writings. So you have wisdom proverbs, you have love literature, the Song of, the song of Solomon, also called Canticles. Um, you have historical works, you have poetry. So it's an interesting collection of very different kinds of writing. And some of this writing is just really, really beautiful literature. So for example, uh, Isaiah chapter 40, this is a prophetic book. And the 40th chapter has a passage that's really beautiful. Now, of course, the beauty that I know of comes to us in English, the English of the King James Version of the Bible. So I don't know what it's like in, you know, in the, in the original language it was written in. But this is, this is great literature, so even people who may not be interested in the theological ideas that are at work in, for example, Isaiah 40, I think they still would recognize it as beautiful literature. Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the, ends of the earth, faints not, neither is weary? There's no searching of his understanding. He gives power to the faint, to them that have no might. He increases strength. Even the youths shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Well, that is, that's good writing. And again, I don't know what that's like in the original language, but in the language of, of the King James Bible, that, that is really good writing. We could also think of the, 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 the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, etc. Very popular passage. Which, again, people who may not be particularly drawn to theological ideas, I think would still recognize, oh yeah, the 23rd Psalm. That is great literature. Okay? So the, the collection of ancient Hebrew writings that we call the Old Testament, it's, it's a real mix. You have prophetic literature, wisdom literature, love literature, historical literature. You have some parts of um, the Old Testament that's just sort of a, a recitation of laws. And uh, it takes a certain amount of perseverance to stick with that as you're, as you're reading. And there are some passages of this ancient Hebrew writing. That, is, uh, that are really beautiful, really, really powerful. One of my favorite, I think probably my favorite um, a part of these ancient Hebrew writings is the book of Jonah. It's a short little book near the end of the Old Testament. I have this image here because when we think of the book of Jonah, those of us who are familiar, familiar with it, we often think of the whale, right, or the big fish or the Leviathan, or however we, we want to think about that. And this is peculiar because the, 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 the whale, the big fish, actually is not a focus of the story. The whale comes, the whale does its job, the whale goes, right? There's, there's no way that the whale is kind of the central point of the story. It plays an important role, but it's not a central point of the story. But, but one of the things I notice is that in an ancient uh, depiction of the book of Jonah, um, it's a little bit hard to see, but you can see Jonah's being thrown out of the boat, and this is a, you know, those of us familiar with the passage will remember this when Jonah gets thrown into the sea, and then he's swallowed by the whale. If you look on the right, it might be a little hard to make out, but there's a creature that uh, doesn't look anything like a whale. Um, you can see its two ears sticking up and its mouth open, and I've, it looks nothing whatsoever like a whale, but some creature has popped its head out of the water and is about to swallow Jonah. So it's interesting that even in this ancient passage, there is this emphasis on this creature that swallows Jonah. And Jonah spends some days in its, in its belly. But I still assert that that is maybe understandable because that's maybe the most surprising part of the story, but it's not the central part of the story. Now one of the things to say before we make the point we want to make about the book of Jonah, is that the ancient Hebrews had very high ethical standards. Very high ethical standards. And the example I'll give you is related to Moses. And we talked about Moses before. And we noted that Moses spends 40, 40 years getting his people from ancient Egypt to the promised land, right? And they could have done it much more quickly, but they're just doing circles because the people he has to deal with are so problematic. And so they're doing these circles and just having one, 
problem after another, one hassle after another. And then we get right to the point where, you know, it's time to, you know, get ready to enter the promised land. And Moses is given a certain order if people want water. And so the Lord said to Moses, speak to that rock before their eyes. It is before the, you know, the people looking on and it will pour out its water. Then Moses raised his arm and struck the rock. Moses was told to speak to the rock, but he struck the rock, right? And immediately my response is like, so what? Like, big deal, you know? Of course, the Hebrew response is, well, that's a human response. But who told Moses? The Lord told Moses, right? Israel's God told Moses, speak to the rock. Moses struck the rock. And the Lord said to Moses, because you did not trust in me enough to honor me as holy in the sight of the Israelites. See, somehow uh, Moses is not following orders, right? Not following orders. That was kind of a breach of the Lord's holiness. You, you get the sense that, you know, the Lord has very high standards. And this is the Lord of the people of Israel. Therefore, the people of Israel, even though they're constantly making mistakes, you know, at least they have this this ideal of these high moral standards. And here their leader is not doing what the Lord says to do. The Lord says, speak, and Moses strikes the rock. And so here's what happens. Because you did not trust in me enough to honor me as holy in the sight of the Israelites, you will not bring this community into the land I give them. Wow, that's pretty rough. I mean, after 40 years, you know, you know, my inclination is to say, man, cut Moses a break, you know, cut him a break. <laughs> he's been dealing with these people for 40 years and he's frustrated, you know. And yeah, the order was speak to the rock and he struck it, you know, but in my inclination is to say, give him a break. But the ancient, ancient Hebrew literature, you know, um, presents a very high moral standard. And Moses didn't, he didn't reach the moral standard. You know, in that moment, in this, in this important moment, he blew it, right? He came short, and so he has to pay. He has to pay a price. So this is one of the things we see in ancient Hebrew literature. Very high moral standards are placed on the people. And if they don't, if they don't adhere to those standards, if they don't obey those standards, if they don't live by those standards, then there is a price to pay. Uh, there are consequences. For example, instead of going right from Egypt to the Promised Land, you spend 40 years, you know, wandering around in the desert. That's one consequence. And here's another consequence. Now, the reason I bring that up is because I think one of the things we see in the book of Jonah is an incredible degree of self-criticism, that is, of cultural self-criticism. And we said earlier that, I mean, one of the amazing things about the ancient Hebrews, the ancient Israelites, is, you know, the, the influence they've had on, on the rest of the world, you know, in one way or another. Um, and one of those things, I, one of those uh, bits of influence I think we see, especially in Western societies, Western Europe and those countries that spring from, from Western Europe, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, the United States, for example, one of the things we see in Western civilization, in Western countries like the United States, like Canada, like Australia, like Britain, like Germany, is a very high degree of self-criticism. We are very self-critical cultures. We criticize ourselves for not living up to our standards. We criticize our history. I think one of the challenges is that sometimes we let, you know, helpful self-criticism sometimes morph into self-hatred, right? And this is something that, that I think we really need to guard against. Self-criticism can be very useful. Self-hatred is not useful, right? And, you know, I guess that's a discussion for a different day. But one of the things we see in Western societies, and also in present-day Israel, is a high degree of self-criticism. Well, where did this come from? Because this level of self-criticism doesn't, it's not global, right? It's not global. It is something that we see in societies that historically are linked to ancient Israel, primarily through Christianity, 
right? Because, of course, the Christians have their own writings, the New Testament, but they also adopted the ancient Hebrew writings, the Old Testament. And so a Bible contains the Old Testament and the New. And so then Christianity becomes this global force. And from there then, I think this ancient Hebrew uh, ethical self-critical spirit uh, has tremendous influence. Anyway, I think we see this at work in the book of Jonah. Let's see what happens. So the very beginning of the book, the word of the Lord came to Jonah. Go to the great city of Nineveh. Now Nineveh, that's Mesopotamia, right? That's, that's Mesopotamia. You see where Nineveh is on the map. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. There's that ethical standard again, right? Yeah, I don't like what the people of Nineveh are doing. They need to change their ways. So Jonah, go preach to them. Now look what happens because Jonah's a prophet. He says, Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. So we have where Tarshish is, is estimated to be, present-day Spain. So you can see Nineveh is one way, Tarshish is the exact opposite direction. So Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Now Jonah's a prophet, right? So we would expect that a prophet... When a, when a Hebrew prophet hears from the Hebrew God, then we expect the Hebrew prophet to act, to do what he's told to do. In this case, the Hebrew prophet does the exact opposite, goes in the exact opposite direction. So as Jonah's at sea, the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. So very, very heavy storm. All the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own God. So these sailors who are not Hebrews, these sailors, we'll just call them pagans. We don't mean that as a put down, just non-Hebrews. So these pagans, they begin to cry out to their gods. And they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. In other words, they're throwing stuff overboard. That's how they make their living, right? This is stuff that they're trading. This is stuff that they're selling. They're throwing stuff overboard and they're, they're losing property. They're losing wealth because they want to save their own lives and the lives of others. But Jonah had gone below deck, where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. So this prophet, who is told to care about the people of Nineveh, does the opposite, goes the opposite direction. And then on the, on the ship, these pagans are calling out to their god, and they are sacrificing economically to save their lives, while the prophet is asleep. And the captain goes down and says to Jonah, Get up and call on your God, right? Now, you would expect that a Hebrew prophet would need to be told that. You would expect that a Hebrew prophet would just do that, right? Because that's the kind of thing that Hebrew prophets are supposed to do. The pagan says to Jonah, Maybe your God will take notice of us so that we will not perish. Now, I, there's a little more stuff that happens, but then Jonah get around, gets around to saying, I am a Hebrew and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Now what's interesting is if you read everything that comes before that statement from Jonah, there is absolutely no evidence for this. It is true that he's considered a prophet, right? And it is true that he's, he is a Hebrew. But we haven't seen any evidence that he worships the Lord, right? We haven't seen any evidence that he cares about what the Hebrew God says. We have seen evidence that he doesn't care about what the Hebrew God cares about. Hebrew God indicating, you know, the people in Nineveh are making a lot of mistakes. They need to clean things up, you know, implication being or else. So Jonah, I don't want to do that. So I want you to go talk to them and, you know, see if you can get them to change their ways. Jonah doesn't care. He goes the exact opposite direction. What's interesting is that here I think we, we begin to see a pattern in this story. That every step along the way... The Hebrew prophet gets it wrong, and the pagans get it right. But this is weird because this is a book written by a Hebrew writer, by an ancient Israelite writer, for an ancient Israelite, an ancient Hebrew, an ancient Jewish readership. And what's interesting is in this book written for an ancient Jewish readership, the Jewish prophet comes out looking not very good at all, Whereas the pagans come out looking pretty good, right? So we'll skip, you know, the next three chapters 
and come right to the end. And I won't give you the detail here. You've got to read, read the story. It's, it's a wonderful, wonderful story, right? But Jonah, he never really gets his act together, and it's very hot, and there's a plant that's giving him some shade, but then the plant dies, and Jonah's very upset because now he doesn't have any shade, and he's also very upset because the people of Nineveh aren't going to be killed. He wants all the people of Nineveh to die, right? So he's upset about that. He's upset about this plant that's not giving him shade anymore. God sent to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? <laughs> It is, Jonah said, and I am so angry, I wish I were dead. I think this is the second time in the story Jonah said, I wish I would die. You know, rather than seeing good things happen to the Ninevites, I'd rather die. But the Lord said, you've been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight, died overnight. I love this. This is one of my favorite sentences in, you know, Hebrew or Christian writings, the Old or the New Testament. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh? Now, this is the Hebrew God speaking. Should I not have concern? But of course, the message to the Hebrew writer is, should you not have concern for the people of Nineveh? In which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left. Should you not be concerned about those clueless people in Nineveh? They don't know their right hand from the left. They're so clueless, right? That's why I wanted to send you, Jonah, to help them get their act together. You did eventually get there and preach, you know, took a whale partly to make it happen. The Ninevites, you know, turned things around and now they don't have to be destroyed, right? Jonah, shouldn't you have compassion on them? And of course, the, the message goes to the reader or to the hearer. Of course, in the, in the ancient world, most people won't read, so they'll, they'll hear this story. So there are 120,000 people who can't tell the right hand from the left. And I love this last bit. And also many animals. I'm also concerned for the animals of Nineveh. Right. Also concerned for them. I think mainly because we're talking about economic well-being. Cap, uh, cattle, sheep, goats. You know, things that help with, uh, you know, having milk, having meat, things like that. So it's a very, very powerful story, an extremely well-crafted one. And I encourage you to read it and to note the whale or the great fish, but then to note that the whale or the great fish, not central to the story really, plays an important role, but comes and goes quickly. So here's what I encourage you to do. Read through the book of Jonah and keep a tally, asking the question, when it comes to caring for the well-being of others, who gets it right? the Hebrew prophet or the pagans. Well, I've already indicated to you how I think things go. But I think this is a useful exercise because it's something that runs through this entire short story, right? Chapter three is a little bit different. I think you really can read, you know, chapter one, chapter two, the first part of chapter three, and then pick up in chapter four. But I think what we, what we find in this amazing ancient story is something remarkable in ancient history, and that is a story that is profoundly self-critical. We have these high ethical standards, but here's a story about how every step along the way, our guy gets it wrong and the pagans get it right. In that respect then, in this important respect, we should be more like the pagans. I've always wondered, you know, what would it be like to be the ancient Israelites who heard this story for the very first time. How shocking the story must have been to them when they heard it for the very first time. So powerful self-criticism here and useful self-criticism. It brings an important message. The Ninevites matter too. The clueless people of Nineveh, they matter too. And we need, we need to remember that. It's a great, great book and I encourage you to read it and enjoy it as the excellent piece of literature that it is.